happens is that that money, okay, sorry. So that money, that money um, cost you, it costs you some money to, to spend it and then wait. So the longer you wait to spend that, to, to get that income for money that you already spent, that is a cost of doing business. So remember that that's a cost. It, it, it may not seem to you like a cost because there's no exchange that you're not putting them on, but actually it is a cost because you are taking a risk that that person's not going to pay you for that product. And you've already paid that, you've already done the work and your time is part of your investment as well as what money you put out. So when you figure out what you want to um, charge for something, remember that that lag time, you have to calculate that into your cost, okay? You can play around with how, how you calculate that into cost. But, Carmen, but can I just that. pop in here? I think that um, you're, the point that you're making is a really great point that it really depends on your product or service in terms of how you're going to manage this because it's quite different. And how long, for instance, if you have to buy inventory way ahead of time and it takes a long time to produce whatever you're gonna produce and then sell it, the cash flow is much different than someone who's doing a professional service who doesn't have to buy that inventory ahead of time. I think it's, um, it's really important for the business owner to have a full understanding of what that cycle is mm -hmm. as they're looking at this cash flow. Sure, but in the, in, like you say, in the services industry, you didn't have to buy the inventory, but you did have to pay for people. You know, that, people are your inventory. So uh, whether you whether it's just you, or whether it's people that you hired, um, you you are ex you are spending money to do that work. And in fact, what's even more of a challenge in the service industry that where it's it's they paying you after the fact is that you do the work, you've spent the money, whether it's your time. And your time is money, right? Whether it's your time or you hired somebody to do something, you finish or you have an interim product or you have a deliverable, we, we call it deliverable, and then you that you can bill for. And then a lot of times that customer takes two, four, six weeks to pay you. So it's not you just fit, you finished it, but you still have two, four, six weeks. And meantime, the person you hired wanted their money right away. Um, you know, they, they, they said, oh, maybe they'll tell you, oh, we'll wait a couple of weeks, but you still, you still have that, that pressure. And then you need to figure out how you deal with that pressure. And there's a lot of different, um, different tricks of the trade that you can deal with that on that. Um, okay. So think about the potential work that you can bid on. And, and so create something that's called a, uh, a pipeline. And a pipeline is potential work that you can possibly get whether you're bidding on it or that you can sell it and figure out what the odds are so if you know for example um if you're doing a kitchen remodeling job and you know that you can you have this list of leads you know what is the probability and and, and what is the income that i can derive from these leads or my estimated income and what is the probability that i can win that work uh, maybe I know the person very well and they were very good at the business with me. So maybe it's an 80% or maybe it's a cold call, but I knew that they wanted to do something, but I know I have a lot of competition and it's a 20%, for example, or a 50%. So you have to be kind of realistic with yourself. Um, and this is where um, I found that learning how to use Excel is very good because they're all tables that you have to build, lists that you have to build. And that you have to say, okay, what, what's my plan for the next month? What's my plan for the next two months or three months? These are the things that I'm planning to do. Um, so planning is important, right? So uh, 
you know, nobody likes to sit there and plan all the time, but it is important that you spend some of your time planning so that you have an idea of what direction you're going in. So then when you see that you have a lot of jobs, but yeah, you're feeling 50-50 about it, determine what you can do to increase those odds. And so it's very important when you determine how to increase the odds, and that's going to be part of your marketing and sales strategy, how to increase the odds. And how to increase the odds, that's what it is. It's developing a marketing and sales strategy. Um, you need to know who is your competition? Where are they going to go? If they're not going to go with you, who are they going to go with? Why are they going to go with that other organization? Um, and what would make you more competitive? In other words, what, what can you do? How can you present your business? Or what is it that that other company that seems to be winning all those jobs, what do they seem to be doing better? So identify those things. Look at the things that you can do better than that company. Sometimes we say, I can do a lot of things better than a company. That company does shoddy work, but they keep getting the work all the time. So maybe the people who are buying that aren't aware that they're doing shoddy work. And maybe they're not aware that you're doing better work. And maybe what you need to do is to get um, past customers to give you statements of how happy they were with your work and put, put that on your website and you goes without saying you need to have a website, right? So you need to have a website to, to say who you are because now, nowadays, I mean, in, in the past, maybe you could knock on doors and put an ad in the, in the magazine and you can still do some of those things, but um, people will look you up if they, they, see, they see you or they hear about you or they see the ad in the magazine even or in one of those mailers, um, they're going to look you up on the website and you need to you need to have that presence so they can take you seriously and then customer testimonials need to be in there um preferably with a name on it but sometimes they don't want you to put a name but at least put you know customer in the in the laurel area or whatever in germantown um so anyhow determine what you can do to increase the odds of winning more business when we're talking about cash flow, a lot of times people think in order to increase cash flow, I need to reduce all my expenses. But I'm of the opinion that in order to improve your cash flow, you need to improve the timing of receiving the money. You need to increase your revenues and manage the timing of spending the money. So that's really what, what really managing your cash flow is about is balancing those things out. So I, I wanted to make sure that if you had a question, this would be a good time to ask me a question because we're going to go into dollars and cents. So uh, I'll, if they're there, I'll, I'll answer them. Uh, if you want to just unmute and speak up, I guess I can, I can take that as well. Okay. Penny, I saw that you unmuted. Did you have a question? No, <laughs> because my business is different. Tell me <laughs> but, about your business. Tell me about your business. My business is like, we have to, I, I, I'm on mute there. We have to send money. We have to prepare a PO for the factory that makes our product for us. So you need to have about $15,000 at a time. When you do the PO? When I do my PO to the factory for, the, for my, my products to have my product produced. So how, long, how long does the factory take? Eight weeks, eight weeks. Now you don't have to fund that PO on day one, do you? They want them, they don't, we are not, we have done it for a long time but they haven't given us credit. So this time I told them that I, I don't, we, can, we cannot do it like that anymore. We have to send a PO and then give them half of the money. And then upon completion, we give them the other half. All right. So, yeah. So so your, your, cash flow, your cash flow piece is uh, when you know you're going to have to buy that, you're, you know you're going to have to get that money to give them the 50% up front. Yes. And then when you are expecting that they will be finished and delivering the product, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Now, when they deliver the product, how do you get the money back? Are you deliver? Are they delivering the product that you're going to then 
collect. No, I have to send them the uh, a check, cashier's check, before they can they will deliver the product. So right. you always have to have more money in the bank. Sure, but you know, <laughs> but how are you going to get your revenue? From, uh, if unless I sell the product, so I have some in inventory that I'm selling. Whilst okay. you, you always have to make sure you have uh, you're having sales and then projections. You have to project. Right. That, okay, maybe in three months I can have this amount of money so that if after the eight weeks I can pay the difference. Right. Yes. So you're still you're still dealing with cash flow because. Um, the moment that you need that you're going to have, you know that you're going to have the need to pay that 50%. Mm -hmm. That's a date that you're going to put on your spreadsheet. Okay. Um, just a spreadsheet like I have right now here. Mm -hmm. and, and, it, and, it, and what you're telling me is that you're spending the money up front. When, I, front, hire, yeah. when I hire somebody, I'm spending the money up front. Mm -hmm. Right? So when, when I, and I'm in the services industry. So when I hire somebody, they're going to be expecting a paycheck in about two weeks, mm -hmm. right? Now yeah. they're going to believe that I have that money for their paycheck today. I may or may not have it, but I better have it when payday is there, right? Yes. So that that is my my PO is when they come on board and I gave them a job offer. My payment for that, my first payment on that PO is the first paycheck that I have to issue, right? Yes. And then at the same time, I have to look at how am I selling? How am I getting my revenue? So the part that you're talking about is where you have to spend the money, but you have to then tie into that. What, what is the rhythm you're going to have for the revenue to come in to, to sell that inventory, right? Yes, you yes. have to balance those two out. You have to complement your, your shortage, and if you will, on the, on the revenue cycle with credit. So the credit, you, you have to then be very strategic that you are making that amount that you need for credit as small as you can, right? So that you don't have to incur interest because whatever credit you give, you're going to get, you're going to be paying interest on it, right? Whatever. Exactly, exactly. Yes. Yeah. So, is that, that's so you it... have to factor that interest as part of your cost of your product. So when you're looking at your profitability, you have to look not just at what product costs you, but what it costs you to store that product until you handed it over. Hand it over. And what it costs you to transact all those things, your time, mm -hmm. and the interest that you have to pay on having put that money up front. And that's why when you're selling product, you're looking at a, a, a at least a 2.5 times factor because you have all those things that are happening, right? You're managing inventory. So, so you don't want to buy something for $20 and sell it for, for 25. So you want to buy something for $20. Ideally, you want to buy something for $20 and sell it for, you know, uh, 40 or $50 because you have to cover that cost, right? So you generally, and I don't, I'm not, I'm, I'm not very familiar with what you do, but generally on products, you have to go that way. And if you're not competitive at the price that you come up with, you're going to have to get a source that gives you less price, or you have to shorten the time that you get the revenue in. You have to ask your customers, you have to establish a customer base that's going to give you sufficient, the timing is going to be sufficient soon enough that you short, shorten the time that you're out of that money. Okay. So your 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 challenge is going to be shortening that time. Shortening that time. Okay, yeah. that's yeah. the first. That's the first time I was trying to get them half and half. We always have to pay up front. If it's thirty thousand, you have to pay it up front. So I what yeah. I would yes. do what I would do. So a lot of times, what I do uh, on product or what I've seen done in products is uh, don't go 50-50, Go twenty percent down. So I yeah. recently I recently bought. For, for Grand Central Station, a million dollars worth of screens, right? Of TV mm -hmm. screens for the displays where it says the train is yes. arriving, right? Yes, okay. yes. So it's a million dollars for these screens. I don't know why you should, why don't they get a big TV set, right? So, but anyhow, so it's a million dollars because it's the screens and the computer systems that are behind it. Um, and, you know, what I negotiated is to give them 20% upfront 
and 80% when I receive the things. And then what I negotiated with the buyer is that, uh, well, of course you had, I already had the buyer in hand, right? So yes, it's, you, you always, yes. Right. It's a little bit different. <laughs> but I negotiated with the buyer that they cover that, that I told them that they have to give me 50%, but I wasn't giving the 50% out. I was only giving 20% out, keeping the other ones in reserve in the event that my buyer was going to be slow yes and 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 so forth so you have to play a little bit on, on that game to make sure that you have cash on hand exactly that's it that's right. very true that's that's what's the problem i have right now yeah yeah so that's an interesting one and i'd love to 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 hear more about it right now i guess we'll move on to a, somebody else who might have a question on cash flow I mean, I just wanted, I just wanted to um, ask um, about the line of credit mm -hmm. um, and um, what guidance would you give in terms of how, how large the line of credit should be? I guess that depends that that's based on your cash needs over like over a three month period, a six month period. How do you, how do you determine how big your line of credit should be? Well, I mean, the line of credit can be as big as you want, because as long as, you know, if they're going to give you a line of credit, that's great, right? So, but, so you want to do, um, ideally, I mean, I say you should get at least three months worth of your expenses, right? Ideally, you want to get, you know, six months worth of expenses. But the bank is, the, the trouble is that the bank who is typically going to give you the lowest the lowest rate of interest okay is is going to look at what your expected revenues are over the next what well, and it, the reliability of your revenues that's the other thing they're going to look at the reliability of your revenues uh, over the next 3 or 6 months and they're going to look at that initially if they don't know you they're going to say well, how much do you make every month I'll, I'll give you 80% of that, right? And that's not good enough. So you have to negotiate with the bank. A lot of people get, get scared to negotiate with the bank, but really you can go to more than one bank. So you have to walk in saying, this is what I would like to have. And this is where your credit score is very important because you have a much more leverage if you have good credit than if you don't. Um, so, your question, um, Marilyn, is how much of a line of credit? Um, if you can show that you're going to make 20% um, profit on your on on your sales uh, over the next year, um, they may well uh, fund, you know, the 20% right of that year, right? Um, and is that the same? Is that enough to cover you the first three months? I don't know. You have to look and see what what that is for you. Um, but the bank is going to look at your financials. There's something called uh, a scoring system by industry. Uh, there are indicators by industry. Um, I I found this out in dealing with a bank that actually I said, "What the heck is your problem? Why can't you give me?" This? <clears throat> and they said, "Look at your financials." And these are the measures that we use. They have specific ratios that they're looking at in your financials. And that is going to tell you what they're going to be willing to lend you. So it's almost like, um, Marilyn, this might be the next class, is, is uh, how do you look at your financials and determine what kind of loan you can expect from a bank? And I, I say bank just because typically you can negotiate a lower rate with them, okay? Um, when you are going in for an SBA loan, and I'm talking about an SBA loan because an SBA can give you a, a $250,000 or $500,000 loan without you necessarily having a 700, 700 points uh, credit score or more. The, the problem with an SBA loan is really an SBA guaranteed loan, okay? So it's a problem and an advantage. You know, SBA is not going to complain too much if you're what you're asking them for is less than five hundred thousand dollars, or definitely they're not going to complain much if it's less than two hundred fifty thousand dollars, as long as your business shows that you're going to be able to do to make that money in a year. And so they can they can guarantee a line of credit. The problem I have with an SBA loan is 
that you have to put your house as collateral if you have one. If you don't have one, they still have to give you the loan anyhow. Uh -huh. so, so, but if you do have one, they're going to want to put that down as collateral. And um, I worked a little bit with SBA um, from an IT standpoint. I, I worked with the lending um, organizations there. <clears throat> and what they, they're, tr they're going to try to give you a loan regardless. Um, but if, if you show that you have title to a house, or that you're paying mortgage in a house, they are going to put that down as collateral. So um, if you go to a bank, they're going to also try to put that down as collateral, but you don't have to tell them that you have a house. You say, no, I don't have a house. It, it's not, I don't want to put it down. You say, I don't want to put it down. And if you do have one, they're going to force you to put it down. But you can still uh, say, well, I, I, I am, I'm, there are reasons why I can't put it down, right? I, I said, I have to take care of my mom and I didn't have to put it down, right? So, so there are things you can negotiate, especially if they know you a little bit, you've been talking to them and so forth. It's not unreasonable to get a $100,000 loan. That's easy. I mean, line of credit, that's the easiest line of credit to get. It's 100,000 line of credit. Um, if you go less, they're, they're not interested in less. I, surprisingly the banks are not interested in small loans because it costs them more money to manage it than what they get out of it so if you have a smaller loan to get i would suggest that you get a credit card if you can and use that but remember that that interest rate right um if you go to the small small what they call the micro lender it's usually if you couldn't get a personal loan on your own. You can go to a micro lender, but you will be paying a little bit more than if you try to get a personal loan on your own. Okay. Thank you. So yeah, and, and then if those people will send you checks in the mail and says, oh, you qualify for $48,000, don't throw it out, <laughs> throw it out, okay? Because they tell you, uh, they can even say, oh, we're only gonna charge you four and a half percent interest but they don't tell you it's four and a half percent interest every three months, you know, or they don't tell you that you have a big fee that you have to pay. And then those, many of those are day loans. So every day, Monday through Friday, you're going to withdraw money from your account. And so that's, that's very troublesome when you're trying to manage your cash flow. Should I answer your question? I don't know, in a roundabout way. No, thank you. That's great. Okay. Um, this is what a cash flow plan kind of looks like. And then uh, for you, these that might be weeks instead of, I just put half months, but it could be weeks or days or just plain old months. And you just have to make a list of what's your expected income um, for every quarter, every three months. So you, you're basically are doing it every week or every two weeks or every month. And you figure out, okay, what is my total income on these months, right? What am I expecting? Um, if you have a job that you're thinking that you're going to be able to get in, like we talked about earlier, but it's 50% um, chance you're going to get, um, then just put 50% of that value down as your projected or expected revenue. Don't put the whole thing in. Uh, if you think it's 20% chance you're going to get it, just put 20% of that value because you want to get as realistic as you can. So when you look at your expenses, you can see how am I going to manage my expenses so I can manage within that framework. Okay. This is um, this is the income as expected. This is the um, what I did here is I'm showing you. I did this in an Excel spreadsheet. <clears throat> so I have here um, my three months: January, February, March. Uh, my income is 22,000. My average monthly income is 7,633. But you notice that, that that's not necessarily true on some of these things. Because two of these is a month, see? So here in this month, I made 7,000, what? 7,100 um, or something like that, uh, which is less than this. And then I, I write down my fixed expenses, 
And I know my average expense. So if you look at it, what I wanted you to look at is that if you look at it in a lump sum, um, you, it looks like, well, in three months, you made $22,000. Uh, and my fixed expenses were 16,000. So I'm, I'm uh, good for uh, 5,400 and what is, I'm, I'm good for, for a um, net after, I, I'm good for a $1,685 profit. But if you look at it from month to month, you'll see, or week to week or, or biweekly, you'll say there's some, some months you are making less than what you need. And so you're going to need to borrow, whether it's some expenses you can put on a credit card and then pay off when you get more money in, but also be very mindful when you are putting something in the credit card to not leave it on that on there for very long. It's very easy to get comfortable and say, um, well, I've, I, you know, I can pay that later because while you're, you're going to pay that later, you have to figure out that that's also costing you. So separating out the cost of of not having the money is, is important. So here's where I'm pointing out some, uh, some things. The impact, of, uh, the impact of failed income receipts. So here, this what I did is I lowered my income. Uh, I said, okay, these people didn't actually pay me what I expected to get. <clears throat> so instead of getting the $22,000 that I thought from my previous slide, I'm really getting 16,398. Well, my, my uh, expenses didn't change very much. So I can see here that my net um, is, is, is negative. Um, and how do I manage that cash flow? And, and my cash flow here, uh, this, was the, this is what, what I expected here. And uh, my available cash actually is this. Right. You notice that there are some months I have a negative. Right. Um, and so that is what you have to manage. And that's why I was saying when you have suddenly more money that you than you what you anticipated, you have to take a chunk of that money and and put it aside. I, I, I like to try to put 20 percent of the money aside in a separate account. If you have a line of credit and you have used some of that line, I would say that when you have income, take 20% of that income and put it to pay down the line of credit. So you have it available for the next time. Because if you have a line of credit and you use it, you use it to buy things that you're not gonna get revenue from, um, you're, gonna, you're gonna cap out your line of credit. The bank's not gonna like it if you didn't pay anything down. They, they like to see that line of credit, kind of like a credit card. They want to see it go up and down. And when it goes up and down, they're willing to lend you more money. If, if you they gave you $100,000 line, line of credit and you have it at $100,000 tapped out, even though they told you that's the credit you can have, after about six months, they're going to say, hmm, this is not what we intended. It's meant to cover those negative times, right? So... Um, if you have something you're buying, uh, like Penny, when you're talking about, you have to issue a PO. Uh, if you cannot, I would say that you want to split some of that PO with a, a term loan, um, because or or use your line of credit. But if it looks like you're not paying it down, take a term loan to pay it down after six months if you haven't paid it down so that you can keep that relationship going on with the bank that they'd be willing to lend you more money. So in the term loan, you say, okay, I'm gonna borrow this money and I'm pay it off in three months. I mean, in, in three years or two years um, or five years. Um, so you don't wanna, but you make, if you get a term loan, make sure you have one that you don't get penalized for paying it off all at once. So you, you have to kind of play with that a little bit. Um, so you don't have a lot of debt running around. If you have credit card debt, make sure that you are keeping it at a 30% of what your credit limit is um, that way and that you're always paying them, even if you, you should subscribe to that automatic pay so that it looks like you're always paying them so they'll be willing to lend you more money. Okay. Do you have any questions on, on any of this so far? Yeah, Carmen, I have a question. Um, 
from the perspective of uh, having a savings a, a savings account, cash yeah. savings account, and a line of credit, would you suggest that um, you always have cash, a, you know, a cash savings, or just simply um, just use the line of credit? Well, I would suggest you try to do both. And I'll tell you why. So line of credit is really great, but the line of credit is money that you owe the bank. And if they are unhappy with you for any reason, um, or if they are being bought out by another bank and they're reassessing their lending, they could lower your line of credit. Um, and so what you thought you had as an allowance, you don't have anymore. And the other thing they can do is they can decide, well, we're gonna term it out. And, and so therefore that credit allowance isn't there anymore. The, and when they term it out, what it means is they're gonna create um, a term loan uh, from your line of credit that you owe. So if you have some money aside um, in, the, in the savings, it gives you a little bit of more leeway and it, I think it lowers your risk. Um, a lot of people don't wanna uh, save money today because the interest rate is so low. So that you have to take that into account. It doesn't make sense to just have money sitting there, right? Um, I noticed that American Express has a program where they don't give you a heck of a lot more, but they do give you a little bit more. So maybe that's a good savings plan. So look for those kinds of opportunities where there, there are savings plans that do pay a little bit more, even if it's just a tiny bit. I think the savings right now is paying almost nothing. So it's almost not worth it. But um, you might want to take some of that money. I wouldn't put all of the money, but some of that money, um, you can either put it in, in uh, this is a terrible word, right? The stock market in, in tech and in, in tech stock, um, but only some, you know, you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket. And then the other one is putting it in the uh, American Express savings, which pays, I think, 0.04% as opposed to 0.04% two or 0 0.001, um, whatever they're paying now. So there are opportunities where you can put money in a savings account and, and not just have it sit there. I would do both. I would, I would pay down my line of credit and would have some money in savings. All right. So how do you manage a drop in income? I have to prioritize your expenses, refrain from non-essential expenses, not a good time to take folks to lunch. Uh, do a bring your own lunch meeting or let everyone bring a dish for, fun, for a fun employee gathering. That's something that, that uh, we've done here. Um, we're gonna have a special day where everybody brings a special dish. And uh, what happens is you've had a team building time where you didn't have to go out and spend money on it, right? You can still have a good time. Um, cancel or suspend subscriptions and you'd be amazed how many things you bought that are on recurring charges on your credit cards. Um, try to see, maybe take, take a few hours to look and see what, what you're paying for um, and try to get rid of non-essential monthly payments. Um, don't give up things that might seem to you non-essential but actually are making you a better company. And those would be things like, um, don't get rid of your website. Don't, don't get rid to, of your membership to um, Gettysburg Germantown Chamber of Commerce. <laughs> because those are things that have, are getting you access to networks. And those are things that help you in your marketing. So some marketing expenses are very, very essential. You want to be able to be in a position to get more business in. Um, so non-essential monthly payments might be, uh, maybe you can suspend your subscription to the gym. I don't know, something like that. You can suspend subscriptions. You can negotiate with credit cards to, to, um, to have three months off or, um, they, there are things you can do. If they say no, they say no. Okay, no harm done. But, you know, just wanted to see if we could, we could get something. If you have a lease um our office lease sometimes you can get the landlord if you've been a good payer 
to forego one or two months um, rent and put it at the tail end of your lease. So that's another way that you can manage your drop in income. You can say, uh, you know, I've, I wasn't expecting this. It's going to pick up again, but I have, um, I have a spot. I have a spot. They don't like you to be three months behind, but they might, you might be able to negotiate one or two months um, and put it at the tail end of the lease. Instead of saying in three months, I'm going to pay you all the, all the rent all at once. You can say, can we negotiate these at the end of the lease? Or can we pay you this month over the course of, you know, just adding a little bit over the course of three to six months. Um, so they could, you know, they're happy to get that call if it's, if you're not already in arrears. If you're not already in arrears, you can negotiate better terms than, than if you're already in arrears, then they don't think you're going to survive. So they're not going to be as willing to do that. If you're in a tight spot, make only pay minimum payments on credit cards. Um, and I don't recommend making only minimum payments normally, but if you're in a tight spot, maybe you need to do that. Uh, don't give pay advances to people. Don't pay for their childcare um, because you just can't afford it right now. Um, and uh, remember to bill anyone that you haven't billed and those people who are slow payers say, hey, how's it going? I, uh, you know, I just want to know if there's any way you can pay me a little bit faster this month because you know, is we'd really we we would really appreciate it. So, don't make your problems your customers' problems because that's going to make you look bad, and then they're not going to call on you again. Uh, so don't say, "Oh, I'm just having a horrible time this month." No, just a little a little cash flow cash flow is a little tight, and I'd appreciate an early payment. Right. So most of the talk is all about cash flow not the, that that you're short of money just cash flow okay what about if you get a sudden increase in income well if you were taken to court pay off by that bill first right so you don't want to be taken to court in fact if somebody threatens to take you to court try to negotiate something uh you can negotiate a a um an, a payback agreement uh, an, an informal payback agreement, you, they'll write it up and, and you, can, you can agree to pay it back in this time period. Um, we had a situation one time where we carried 30 people on somebody's contract for four months um, and the customer didn't pay us for four months. And at the end of the four months, they said, oh, you know what, we're going broke. <laughs> and so, so we had all this all this uh, money that we had paid out for 30 people. So um, I got to the place where I, I needed to, to, to cover this, you know, I had borrowed to, to, to pay to cover the payrolls and everything. So what they ended up doing is negotiating with us that instead of paying us the four months, they would pay us three of the months and, and they dragged it out over the course of 18 months. And they took those three monthly payments for, 30, for the 30 people and paid us a little bit of time over 18 months. And then if we didn't agree to that, I and mean, we negotiated that, we went back and forth. But if, if we hadn't come to an agreement, they could have easily said, well, we're gonna put it all in our bankruptcy filing, you get nothing, right? So, or if you do get something, it'll be however many years later. So it's always better to try to negotiate things. Pay the bills that charge you interest first. If somebody's not charging you interest on your bills, I know they're being a nice guy and they should be paid first, but pay the bills that charge you interest first because you're in a tight spot. Yeah, even though you have this sudden increase in income, you don't always have that sudden increase. So you have to manage that. And for non-interest bearing accounts, pay when the payment is due, but don't hurry up and pay them ahead of time. If you received an extension on a payment deadline, if they said, oh, you can, you can pay in three months, wait until you are close to the extended deadline, even though you already got the money, because if you're expecting to not get the money next month, you could use that extended deadline. Um, put as high a percent of your new money aside in a savings account or pay down your line of credit if you have one. Um, this is talking about that savings account we talked about a few minutes ago. 
And if you don't have one, request a line of credit from the bank if you have not yet done so. It's best to ask for a line of credit when you don't need it, and when you have cash in the bank, when you have a sudden increase in income, ask for that line of credit. Say, I'm, I expect, I anticipate I might need this line of credit next year or later on this year. I'm applying for it now. They love that, okay? Then they see your bank account, say, oh, they've got money. I'll give them a line of credit. Um, here's some uh, tips to improve your cash flow. Uh, ways to improve your sales is always my best favorite way is to increase sales. Uh, network uh, with people that can give you referrals, can give you tips, can give you leads, advertise, use social media. Social media is like uh, a must these days. I'm, I'm not really totally up on it. I should be as a tech company, but I've come to rely on some of the people who work here, but I probably should learn more about it. <laughs> I do. It works. They say that they say that people remember you if they see your name and your communications, and they have to look at it at least six times before they start remembering you. So if you send out an email trying to sell something to people, um, they'll see it and say, oh, that's interesting, but they'll forget it because they have so many other emails. But if they see it six times in, in a short period of time, it, it'll stick with them a little bit more. And then I'll ask old customers for referrals. Call friends and family for referrals. Don't, don't forget them because they might, they might know some, they might have some ideas. They might know um, somebody who's looking. Um, make sure you have a website with a web domain that reflects your company name. Not a mastercontractor at gmail.com, but rather get a quote at mastercontractor.com. Always works better and makes you look like a more serious business. Um, create and manage a website uh, if you don't have one. Uh, I found that Fiverr.com, if you want to just get a starter website, does a pretty good job. Uh, it's a group of consultants that you can reach um, through Fiverr.com. You say, here's what I'm looking for. And there's people from all over the world, but they do speak English. So um, get certifications that help you stand out in, in your industry. If there are certifications that help you stand out, make sure you get them. If you have to take a course, get them. Um, you know, I'm in the IT business. Um, I recently got my OSHA 30, uh, for construction. And the reason was because I was finding that I was doing IT work and management consulting work and, and business consulting to people who are in the construction business. So it makes me, I think more interesting if I have an OSHA 30 cert certificate, then if I don't. And, and it tells my customer that I'm interested in the industry that they're in. Um, so I, I just did it for fun. I learned a lot. Um, equally, I'm uh, supporting a lot of uh, IT services for public transit, the metro systems, for example. And I'm now a, a certified public transit safety uh, consultant. Um, so things like that in, in different industries have different certificates and certifications. And so if you don't have one, get one. Not, not any old thing, but something that's recognized in your industry would be good. Um, sign up for training in your field. You can always say, hey, you know, I just took a course on blah, blah. And um, I learned it. Or you don't tell them because if you're supposed to already have known that, but then you're in a better position to have conversations with your clients about things that interest them. And it makes you a more interesting vendor. Um, register the company in, in uh, procurement databases. If, if your work is such that um, public sector or large corporations procure, um, register yourself on their procurement databases. I, it's not my top priority because I don't know how often they actually go look at them. Everybody says, oh, I'll get yourself on my database and then you never hear from them again. But when you are talking to them, if they happen to ask you if you were in the procurement database and you said yes, then that really helps. So, so things like uh, McCormick Spices, you can get on their procurement database. Um, 
General Motors, um, Lockheed Martin. Uh, Montgomery County has a procurement database where they use, that they use to find um, local small businesses um, on the local small business reserve. Uh, Prince George's County has that, Howard County has that. Everybody has their own little thing. So, you know, find the ones that interest you and, and, and sign up or go to their websites and say and see what they have. Sometimes they have things like saying, we're looking for a small business that does this. Um, so it's worth doing it. Okay, uh, thanks for listening. Do you have any questions? Do you have any questions on certifications or registrations or anything like that? I'm, I'm happy to, to take on questions. I may not have the answers, but I'll give it a try. And uh, Marilyn, can... I have a, I'm sorry, not Marilyn, uh, Carmen, I have a question. Yes. You mentioned uh, increasing your personal credit score yeah. with the 650, try and increase it a little bit. Yep. But then um, you mentioned credit cards. So with a small business, I don't have a business credit card. I have a debit card for my bank, mm -hmm. but I have my personal credit card. Mm -hmm. So for tracking purposes, how can I uh, use my personal credit card in the interim to okay. make payments? Yeah, so, so you can get a um, corporate credit card under your name and your social. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, and, and, and actually American Express is pretty good about this. So you can actually go to American Express and say you want a corporate American Express card. And, uh, and, they, um, and then it, they ask you for your name and your social security. So it, it, it really is under your credit, but you, it's easier for you to track it because you have a corporate credit card that you're only going to use for your business. And so you don't mix it up with your stuff. It's better to not commingle the things. I also yeah. have a bank of, yeah, the same things. I have a bank of America credit card that's for business. Um, and they, and, and it's under my name and my social security number. Um, but they also have my, my, um, my name, my company name on the card. And so I know that that's my company credit card, bank of America credit card. I have a personal one. And I use my, in my case, I have a different business address for my home and my business, right? So uh, my business credit cards get billed here and, and my personal credit cards get billed at, at home. And I do keep them separate. Um, even though my social is in, in it, it doesn't matter. If you go to, if you're using QuickBooks and you want to tie in your credit card expenses um, for your business, uh, what, they, what you do in QuickBooks is you put in, um, you basically tie in the, the credit card portal. So if you're using a, a credit card that you have for your business under your name, um, you can link that to your QuickBooks for your business. Um, and then you, you build that. Uh, my, my Bank of America credit card for my business has a much higher credit, um, much higher credit um, ceiling than my personal one. So uh, even though it's my, it's the same, it's the same number. The only one that isn't using my, my actual social security for, for the credit card is the bank. So I use bb &T, which is now Truist. And when they issued me, when I opened up, um, when I got my line of credit and I got my, my bank um, checking account for the business, they offered me a Visa card and because the, the checking account is under the company name, they gave me a visa card with the corporate. I mean, it's the checking account for, for the business is on, it has a tax ID for the business. Oh, the EIN, okay. Right, so then mm -hmm. when they gave me the, the credit card for, um, for BB&T, the visa credit card, it, it is under the um, tax ID for the business. But when, when you're the principal for a business, it, you can trans, you have to keep your, your paperwork in order, but you can, for example, you can earn money um, as um, Jane Doe or whatever. And um, if, if Jane Doe owns the business, she can say, this was, this was money that was made out to Jane Doe, but it was really for my ABC knitting company, right? So you can, you, you just have to have paper that backs that up. Just in your okay. 
Thank you. Okay. Other questions? I'm, I'm Carrie. No. Hi, hi everybody. Sorry I was late. Um, so my question is about that. Like, how does our LLC, like the EIN number, like what Resenda was saying, like how, where do we try to get credit cards in? I don't have a, you know, I have a check card to, attached to my business bank account and I've just got my LLC. But I think what I'm wondering is how does that, how does that mix? Like, do we, I hear what you're saying, Carmen, like you can get one and it's attached to your um, social. But do we also want to then also completely separate ourselves also? Like you were saying before, you have one that's, how does that line up with our, how we have ourselves, um, uh, you know, legally as our legal entity, as LLC, as sole proprietor? I don't know if that question's clear. You know, is right. there is. So, so say you're an LLC, in my case, I'm a C Corp. Okay. Um, so, so I guess that's even more, more so, <laughs> more so than you would think that everything had to be in the EIN. Um, but it, it's just it's just how you account for it, right? So the IRS isn't going to say, aha, this credit card was under your social, right? Because it's because you're recognizing it as an account for the company. So when you recognize it as an account for the company, uh, you are putting in your tax return that this credit card expense was for for this EIN, they don't they don't go back and reconcile the the tax ID that's on the credit card. They they are taking what you're saying and you have the backup uh, receipts hopefully in your files and say this is this was a company expense. Is right? there but there is there a benefit to is establishing credit in the company name sure. versus yeah. Yeah. um making sure that your personal credit score is high. I, I mean, ideally you do both, but is it right. better to, to um, have the credit card in the company name? Yes, it is. It's better to have the credit card in the company name, whether it has your social security number or, or the company's tax ID. Um, it's better that the credit card says, um, you know, Jane's Knitting Company, right? Uh, or, you know, Digital Transformation, dot, you know, dot LLC or whatever. Um, whether or not it has your tax ID or not, it's still, it's still being accounted, it can still be accounted for as a company expense, right? Uh, and, and it can still be included in your company tax return. Is it better if you can get a credit card that's exclusively in your in the company ID? Yes. Um, can you get it? You can ask the bank and you can say, I'm okay with you putting it under my social because they want to have that guarantee. That's the reason they're going to go over there. And then you say, but can you also add my company um, tax ID? In the case of my credit card with BBNT, I did that. I said, but at, at that point, I kind of knew the, the manager I was talking to, so I don't know how it works if you don't. But I said, I would like, they offered me the credit card. I said, I would like this credit card to be tied into my company account. My company account has this tax ID. So I want that in there. Will they let, will they have, have you signed that, that you, when you opened up a checking account for your business, they, they still ask you for your social. They, they asked you for your tax ID but they still ask you for, you know, are you a principal in this company and, and what's your social? Are you a signatory and what's your social? So they have both there. Um, so they can give you a credit card that has both there. Um, it's better to establish credit. There's no, the, the thing is there's no real credit bureau for the company. I mean, there's Dun & Bradstreet, but you know, I, I'm a skeptic for Dun & Bradstreet, from Dun & Bradstreet. I, I, you know, I hope there's no Dun & Bradstreet people on the call, <laughs> but I've always been a skeptic with Dun & Bradstreet because they're, they're in it, they're a business. And um, what made them relevant was because they were able to sell to the federal government and a lot of the public sector companies that they could use their system to put identifiers on companies without having to use the tax ID. And 
they're not very diligent on how they track all these things. They need you to tell them what you owe, what, where, when. And then they want you to pay them so they can track these things and give you a better uh, uh, thing. So, I mean, I have my own little horror stories with Dun & Bradstreet. One of them was that they decided that to, to lower my score because apparently I owed $800,000 to somebody. They couldn't tell me who it was. They were not allowed to tell me who it was according to them. I was I had no knowledge that I owed this money and it took me like four months to get them to take it out. And when they, I, they took it out, it was only because they said, in order for us to tell you who this is, you have to pay this premium money to get onto this program that we are selling you for $5,000 a year to get onto this VIP thing. And then maybe we could tell you who it is. So once I did that, they said, oh, well, good news. It was a mistake, but we'll, for your $5,000 a year, we'll make sure that it doesn't happen again. So... So, you know, I'm skeptical, but anyhow, some people love them and that's fine. Uh, but the, 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 the answer is that, that uh, there is no equivalent to Equifax and Experian um, and TransUnion for business. Mm -hmm. so, so that's why people, that's why banks are interested in having you put your social security in there. Rosinda, did you have another question? Uh, no, no, I didn't. Um, so, Carmen, the, the, you, you alluded to this earlier on, the, the, uh, the difference between the credit card and the line of credit. Yes. Um, is it just whatever is easiest for you or what's the preference? Mm. Well, you should have both. Um, it's sometimes easier to get a credit card than it is to get a line of credit. Um, unless you have a lot of experience with your banker, right? Uh, but you should strive to have a line of credit. Uh, a line of credit offers you better interest rates. You're probably, today, you're probably sitting at about 4%, you know, something like that on a line of credit. And the, uh, whereas the credit cards generally are a little bit more. Um, the line of credit doesn't increase because you failed to pay this monthly amount and you made a mistake and you got late and then now they're going to charge you more um, like the credit cards do sometimes. Um, the line of credit is typically a higher credit limit than, than a credit card. Um, and uh, you are establishing a relationship with the bank that it serves you when you have a, a new job that suddenly you don't have enough money in your line of credit to cover, but you have a contract and you need to get more money. So suddenly you have a contract that's for $500,000 and the banker is willing to give you a $300,000 line of credit or a $400,000 line of credit. So um, that's something you can't do with the credit cards very well. Mm -hmm. So I suggest both. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, can I just make a plug for having a relationship with your banker? Uh, I think that that's, um, uh, that's important. And um, uh, from the chamber's perspective, we, you know, we, we have a lot of uh, personal bankers, uh, you know, that, that you can talk to and, and, create that relationship. Um, I think, and, and as Carmen mentioned earlier, um, a good time to have that, to create that relationship is when you don't need them. Right. Because if you, if you establish a, a, a personal relationship with your banker, it's just so much easier than when, when you are in need. Um, they, they know you, they trust you. Um, and they can kind of help you out. <clears throat> we we had that experience when we were going through the PPP process during the pandemic. Um, you know, having a relationship with our banker was was great um, to to help us get through that. Right. Yes. And then you know, here I've I've been banking with BBNT for a long time. Good times and bad times. Um, if you have a good relationship with your banker and you run into trouble, 
they're less likely to say, oh, okay, forget you, you know, you have, we're calling your loans, <laughs> which can happen, I guess it's happened to some people. Um, the bank will try to work with you. you know, generally, the bank will try to work with you. But if they know you personally, they will do, they will do more for you. I, um, my, my credit cards were delivered to the wrong address. Uh, they delivered them to the old address that I haven't been there for three years. So I, I never got my new credit cards. And I try to get my new credit cards. They, somebody said, oh, you have to call Visa, blah, blah, blah. I called my banker. I didn't call my banker. I sent them an email and I said, look, I'm having this problem. It's from your bank. Um, I'm waiting forever. I've been on hold for an hour. I can't deal with this. And he wrote back, said, don't worry about it. We'll take care of it. You know, that's kind of nice. Especially when you're trying, when you have so many things on your on your plate to get to get done. And so the next day, he said, "You should have your credit cards in the mail, and then, you know, FedEx to you in the next 24 hours." So that was nice. So there are little things like that 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 you can still get that kind of service. Um, but you also you also need to remember that you can negotiate with your bank. So when you get a loan or um, a line of credit and they charge you closing fees, you can say. Uh, I'd really prefer that you don't charge me these closing fees. And so, oh, yeah, I know you'd prefer it, but we charge that. And, and he said, well, then let me wait because I might might think about going to another bank. Then so you can negotiate. Do it nicely so that they don't feel like you're being, you know, totally mean to them, but you can negotiate with them. Questions? Oh, you, you know, um, Carrie, you, you were talking about having a cash card. But can't you just go back to them and say, oh, I'd like to get a, um, a credit card and then not use it necessarily unless you absolutely have to. But it's nice to have it just in case. Right. So so that would be that would be something that I, I would I would suggest that you do. All right. Any other questions? Okay. So, so Carmen, how would you suggest, um, it, you know, we have our, uh, our work group in two weeks. What, what would you suggest in terms of um, uh, homework for, for the, the group? Basically maybe understanding their cash flow. Um, does anybody, yeah, does everybody here uh, know how to use Excel? Does everybody, does anybody here not know how to use Excel? Do I see any hands up? No? Nope. Okay. All right. So what I would suggest that you do is you open up an Excel and you say, and you try to fill it in for your cash flow and say, here's what I'm anticipating my income to be. You know how, how I did that? I mean, you can have these spreadsheets if you want. Actually, I think I have, uh, let's see. Uh, okay. So, right here, for example, just create a spreadsheet like this. Um, if you want to look at it by the week or by the month, just, just create those columns. What is your expected income? Uh, what are your fixed expenses? I think knowing what your fixed expenses are versus your, your um, non-fixed expenses is important. Um, and, uh, you know, do do that and see what what is your cash flow going forward in the next six months that'll be a good exercise if you have these columns being a monthly thing that'll be easier and then list out this is um i just shrank my excel spreadsheet for this purpose but let's see see if i can get this uh I don't know. You can't see that, can you? No. I think you have to unshare and reshare. I stop share and reshare. Let's see if I can get there. It's only been two years. I'm still trying to figure it out. The, the whole know. Zoom. <laughs> yeah. So, um, let's see. Yeah, so, so if you put something down like this, it would be helpful. Let's see. 
uh, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, here. Hmm. Yeah, and I think that if you have this, you know, the the um, monthly uh, cash flow or, or however, when, as I mentioned at the very beginning, you know, the chamber cash flow, it's good to understand what your annual cyclical cash flow needs are. So right. for instance, I know that I I'm heavy cat I have heavy cash at the beginning of the year. That's when I get my corporate sponsorships. Mm -hmm. And um and but but then I also know come October, November, I'm tight. And so at the beginning of the year, I'm not really focused on cash flow. And of course, we've been around for 72 years. So we have a we have a pattern, right? Um right. but um October, November, we're looking at cash flow every two weeks because that's when payroll comes out. And so uh, the Monday before our pay, you know, every other, every other Monday, we're looking at cash flow because every other Friday, that's when the that's when payroll hits the bank, right? Mm -hmm. So right. Um, it you might be looking at your cash flow um, every week during tight times, and then when you're flush, then you know, you know that you're going to, you know, you're fine for a, a period of time. Um, right. And, and, and what I do is um, in my non-fixed expenses, I add a line for, um, for cash reserves so that, um, see, I don't, I don't think I did it in this example. Uh. <laughs> okay. Let's see. Anyhow, so here where it says non-fixed expenses, um, I have a list of things. Uh, and, and what you can do is add a line for uh, savings. And, um, and then as you do your, your, your do, as you do your cash flow projections, you can um, um, then when you have a, a month that you think you're gonna get more money in, put in a non non fixed uh, expense as as contribution to your savings. And then you can try to even out your cash flow that way. Because then you can say my revenue is going to be my my contribution from my savings, you have a contribution from my savings, and you have a contribution to my savings, that you're basically cre creating your own um, your own savings account, your own line of credit, if you will. And, and uh, even if you can create your own line of credit, that would be awesome. You can still get the bank's line of credit, but if you can use your savings account as conceptually your own line of credit, that would be the best, the best way. Okay. 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 Can you just share these slides? We yeah. can use the spreadsheet as an example on the homework. Sure. Uh, I will send them to Marilyn. Yeah, okay. and we'll I'll see if Stephen can send them out. And we can, um, uh, I'll talk with Stephen about homework. And I think that having people go through the exercise of creating this um, and, and uh, you know, from, from the perspective, it, you, you should have your um, whatever financial software some some of you may be using very sophisticated software. Some of you may have a bookkeeper to do that. Some of you may be using just a, something like a spreadsheet, uh, Excel spreadsheet, right? So everyone's got different levels of complexity in terms of managing your cash flow, depending on depending on your business. Um, but I think that the the standard uh, uh, principles. What is your expected cash revenue, which again is different than your the revenue on your book. So for instance, when you, if you're in a cruel basis accounting, you're, you, um, you look at revenue based on when you put it, when you uh, create your invoice. What, if you're on a right. cash basis, it's when the cash comes in. So 
right. for this but for these purposes you're looking at when the cash comes in when you're expecting to get the cash um, right, and, right. and when you're expecting to the cash to go out yeah i think the difference is that in bookkeeping when you're talking about the accrual and the cash basis it's things that have already happened in the um, cash projections or in your cash flow, and rather in your cash flow, you can use cash projections, things that haven't already happened. So some of it might be uh, James Hardy and company, I may already have done work for them and I'm expecting them to pay me on the 31st of January. But, you know, maybe uh, the green connection hasn't actually happened yet, but uh, I'm pretty sure that's coming in. And that's where I was telling you, if you have something that hasn't happened yet, but you have a probability of whether it's going to come in or not, you have to give it a percent probability. Um, is it, if you really don't know, you got to be down at 10% or 20%. If, if you kind of feel like, uh, yeah, maybe that's 50%. If you are definite, definite, but it's never, it's never a hundred percent. If you don't have it in the only thing that's, um, Ha, I, that is is a hundred percent is what's what's already been signed and even then it's probably not a hundred percent it's probably like 90 percent because it can back out so um but if you've already if you already have done the work and you're just waiting for the for the money to come in then that's a hundred percent um so think about that and what i would what i would do in fact what i would do is i would um here I, where I have, uh, I, I see it here, I, ha I have type. Job is something I've already, I'm already committed. Hope is what I think, right? So, mm -hmm. so, um, so put some hopes in there. So put some things that you are thinking about, this might come, this might happen. I wouldn't recommend putting anything that's lower than 50% because it can skew all your cash projections. But if it's 50% or more, put it in there and just call it, you know, hope 50 or hope 80 or whatever. And then just put that percentage of the value of what you think it's going to be. It's going to be. Yeah. And then I think that the more, um, uh, you know, the more history you have, the better your projections become. Um, and, and, uh, you know, the difference of, of, you know, what you're hoping for and what you're, what you think you're going to get. And I also think that discipline, um, is, is part of it. Um, you don't have to do this report. This report, you could live your whole life without ever doing a cash flow projection, um, but uh, it'll be much easier um, to, it, to anticipate when you're going to have cash flow problems, how much it's going to be, and how you're going to resolve it. Um, so I think it, I think there's a lot of discipline involved in creating this, this kind of report. Um, and then also the issue of some, some of you may, this kind of a task might be a very simple task because you're comfortable with numbers, you're comfortable with the Excel spreadsheet concept. Um, but for some of you, uh, it might be a scary uh, task. And, and that, and that's the whole point of of this program is that if this, if when if you look at this spreadsheet and think, oh my gosh, I could never do that, that's that that's why we're doing this is to get you uh, comfortable and familiar to do that. Um, just, yeah, and we and all know is, that just because you have a great business idea and just because you have a great business doesn't necessarily mean you know how to do an Excel spreadsheet. So uh, don't don't right. feel embarrassed that you don't know how to do this spreadsheet. No, I, I think the whole point of the exercise is to get you to do that because you have to feel like you're driving your car and you have to feel like you're driving your business. And so even though you have you might have a wonderful bookkeeper and great software, get yourself in front of this Excel spreadsheet and do this because you start you start feeling it and you start understanding how it goes. And you may not understand it when you first do it. But as you get things together, you start saying, oh, I see, maybe that could be working out. So the spreadsheet has formulas embedded in it. So that, that should, you could just use the spreadsheet and just change all the numbers around or whatever. But you'll see that there are formula, formulas on it. Um, 
especially when I drag the money from one place to the other to do the cash flow projections. Um, you'll see right here, um, these numbers are formula and this, this number, uh, this number is okay. There are formulas in here, believe me. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. okay. Cash flow, right, right. This is, there you go. So it's really like this is being added. This is being added to, to um, this is being added to that to get to that. And this is negative. So that's why you get a smaller number here. I don't know. Do it. And then it gets out. There are formulas. I won't try to remember what all the formulas are, but they are in there. <laughs> Okay. okay, I think, well, um, there was, let me just look at the chat. Um, yeah, somebody had to head out. Um, okay, so um, uh, Stephen will uh, follow up with everyone and get, make sure that you have, uh, a whole, we'll get the slides from Carmen, get those to you. We'll get you a homework assignment, um, but I already know that, you know, the homework assignment is for you to create a uh, cash flow spreadsheet. Um, and right. um, and then we'll we can talk about it, share it at, at our uh, work group um, in yeah. two weeks. Awesome, great. And then Thank Stephen al Stephen also sent out. We're going to save the date for a uh, in in the end of March for a celebration. So just put that on your calendar as well. So yay! Cool that. Yeah. Yay! <laughs> okay, okay, great. Well, everybody have okay. a beautiful day and get outside. It's Thank gorgeous. You. Yeah. Thank, you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. 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 Okay. Thanks, Carmen. We'll see you soon. Thank you. I hope that helped. Oh, it was great.